This is the sound of time. This is its silence. Here is an album of days, the silver and lilac of spring, golden summer all honey and thunder, autumn of showering coppery light, the iron of winter with its ice and sleep. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The sun was an ancient god. His seasons of sunlight divided the hunting hours. These were the dawn people, hunters and fishers. Men with clocks in their bellies. And here began a thing known only to man. In the anxious moments of the hunt, time was born. And time passed. Preparing for eternity, a thousand years of Egyptian sleep had waited these stones. The Egyptian kings, hungering to be immortal, invented the longest death. To the star-watching priests of the River Nile, high flood on the Holy River, and the rising of the dog star measured our journey round the sun. But in the fields, time was the slow drag of elastic hours on the shadow clock as summer lengthened the day. This is the long and the short of Egyptian time, a symbol for eternity and for a day. For an hour and for an instant, the time it took a hippopotamus to raise his head from the water, glance around, and hastily submerge. An instant, a thousand years, across the wine-dark sea. Decorum, proportion, relations in space, and the ordering of things and men were the interests of classical times. Rome was the dial hand of the age. Its heavy shadow ordered the world with a sword, ordered with a sword and a sundial. But a sundial keeps disorderly hours. The long day of summer and the short day of winter are equal on it. Greek mathematics and Roman ingenuity formed the hemicyclium. But at night or in bad weather, the hemicycle slept. Clepsydra, the water thief, could measure indoor time subtracting drops of water from the hour or filling a copper bowl. Drifting hours of the ancient world. But water will freeze. Sand is more constant. Or at night, the pale flame of a time ring candle burning away the evening hours. Practical Romans planted timekeepers everywhere. Behind the marble decorums of the god emperors 20 centuries ago, a Roman poet saw something else. The time-haunted man who is modern in any age. Again an instant, centuries northward, through the Gothic night.
In the prayerful dark of the Middle Ages, the canonical hours, matins to vesper song, rang down from the tall cathedrals. Six hundred and six died St. Gregory, surnamed the Great. And after him, Sabinianus succeeded being 63rd Pope. He commanded clocks and dials to be set in churches to distinguish the hours of the day. dark tower, time is an arrangement with gravity. Far below 1,500 pounds of lead harnessed with ropes and shafts drive the iron clockwork, transmitting motion and changing speed. Gears mesh their teeth and bend to their work. The slow weight of hours, speeded, swung to, measured and balanced, strike the notes that spread God's time over tight fields for drover, shepherd, and tiller of soil in these years before the second or minute were measured. The foliage balance swings with the force of the weight's pull. The power of the weight escaping bit by bit. This crickety eloquence is the first sound of modern time, though not yet an accurate device. In those days, a tower clock which kept God's time within an hour or two was a good clock sufficient to its purpose. As centuries passed, moving through the Renaissance toward the ornate Baroque, clocks became more remarkable in their embellishments. The great clock at Strasbourg, in the shape of a high altar, intricately carved and decorated, controlled elaborate provinces of time. This great clock counted the phases of the moon, named the days, and numbered the ages of man. It could do almost anything except keep accurate time. And lost in this ornamental jungle, with the lowly hands that told the time of day. Clocks spread their quiet orders over Europe, pointing with unwavering finger to the hour, commanding all to recognize the truth of their assertions, whether they were true or not. But a portable clock, that is, a watch that would work in the traveler's pocket, awaited a new source of power, the iron spring of the locksmith Peter Henlein drove its single hand. Created around 1500, the first watch was portable if you had a small boy to carry it. As they grew smaller, portable timekeepers, though not accurate, became highly fashionable. For the Renaissance Englishman who had everything, there was still a possible present. 
Like the intricate jewelry of Elizabethan speech, these watches were more the products of art than science. And a sensible man carried a sundial to correct the fickle mechanism, which it is said is why a man's vest has two pockets even now. Finally, the foliate balance was replaced by the pendulum, bringing more accuracy to clocks. And the balance wheel and hairspring brought accuracy to watches. By the end of the 18th century, on the other side of the Atlantic, a new atmosphere was developing. The 19th century magically released a furious energy. Iron beasts in feathers of smoke and steam pounded through the sleepy villages. As the country contracted in the iron embrace of the railroads, appointments were kept sometimes tragically. Train wrecks dramatize the railroad's need for accurate timekeeping. Out of this need, a watch company was born, and the railroad watch became a symbol of accuracy. Now, a division as small as a minute could mean the difference between life and death. By the end of the 19th century, railroad watches symbolized precision not only for the railroads, but for the whole order of an industrial nation. And as the 20th century began, a personal timepiece became necessary for telling time instead of being merely an ornament. Now the world has become a crackle and roar of power. Electricity powers the 20th century. And the newest use of 20th century power for timekeeping is found in the world's first electric watch. Electricity is the first new source of power for portable timekeepers since the mainspring was invented almost 500 years ago. We have finally progressed beyond mere improvements on a 16th century invention. Here, a tiny energy cell does away with a mainspring, supplying a year or more of power. It needs neither winding nor motion to keep it going. In 1668, a Hasuerus Fromentil published an advertisement that is lately a way found out for making clocks that go exact and keep equaler time than any now made without this regulator, not subject to alter by change of weather, and may be made to go a week or a month or a year better than those that are wound up every day. Today we have in fact surpassed Mr. Fromentil's ideas of accuracy. But how much accuracy do we need? That depends on whether you are catching a train or traveling to the nearest star. In our search for more precise timekeepers, we are reaching for an absolute, something more exact than those ancient timepieces, the sun and the stars. We have learned to count the heartbeat of a quartz crystal with 100,000 pulses in a second we have counted the vibrations of an atom. We can measure the present in microseconds or journey down the great cliff of the past. 200,000 years to a stone axe, 400 million to the Ordovician strata, down the vast subcontinents of geologic time, past the lost Edens of dinosaurs and fishes, to where fossils of Cambrian trilobites sleep in stone.
past them a billion years to the empty rock laid down before life began, where number has lost its meaning. Time is an ocean in which we swim and drown, or it is a thread which ties a gone past to a future not yet real, passing through us in the endless instant that is now. <laughs>